Welcome to Two Wheels and on this week's show Jeff takes a ride on Ducati's latest sports tourer, the ST4 and we'll be meeting a man who drives a car powered by two Kawasaki motorcycle engines and later we'll be taking a look back at some of our favourite bits of the last 12 months. Sports Tourer is an incredibly popular sector of the market and you can get big ones like this, ZZR11, you can get Honda's Blackbird or you can get the Hayabusa. But then again, in the middle you get things like Honda's VFR800 and Triumph Sprint ST, both great bikes. Then you get a Sports Tourer which is more sports than tourers and that's where Ducati fit in with the ST4. Now I was going to have the ST4S, the one with the 998 engine, but they've gone and sold it would you believe. So let's see what this one does. But before that, what's the difference? About 80 cc's and a few trick suspension bits, that's all. In fact, the Sport Turismo ST4 is the middle one of a trio, starting with the 900 engine ST2. This one, however, takes the 916 four valve Desmo motor to give it a bit more oomph. The engine's had a bit of black box tuning, different throttle bodies and a slightly heavier flywheel than the ordinary 916, and that makes it more tractable and smoother. And of course it's character that Ducatis are all about and it starts with that engine sound. Now the prop stands interlocked with the ignition so it won't start with it down at all, even with the clutch in. But if we fire him up, now you hear that engine noise, you also hear a rattle down there which some people can't stand. Can you hear that clutch? Cha -cha 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 -cha. Listen, but that's because it's a dry plate clutch. That's all part of the Ducati magic. On the road though is where it counts. At 215 kilos, it's 8 kilos heavier than a Triumph ST, 5 kilos up on a Prilius Futura, and just a tad heavier than a VFR. But with 107 brake horsepower and a lithe chassis, you wouldn't know it. The ride is firm but forgiving, and combined with fluid handling, this bike gives you the feeling that it would do well on the track. A sort of foggy in a suit. Talking of suits, I wasn't expecting it, but this has come with three suitcases. All right, they're not suitcases, they're side cases and a top box, but there's a hell of a lot of room in there. There's room for a suit and a couple of dresses, if that takes your fancy. But I'll tell you something else they've got. These are actually quickly detachable. And just like that, as Tommy Cooper said. And look at it, doesn't it look fantastic? A completely different bike. <laughs> Well, all right, perhaps not fantastic, but it does look completely different, doesn't it? It's lost a lot of that sort of weight or the look of weight, so it's a trim sports bike now. Anyway, when we're talking about your looks, I first tested one of these, the ST2, back in 1997, and the looks haven't really changed since then, but I don't think they've dated. It still looks very classy to me. Nice, smooth fairing there, nice, rounded, rounded headlamp. Comes back to a nicely sculpted tank. Down there, of course, is that big eight-valve Desmo lump with its World Superbike heritage, which also goes for the frame as well, because that frame is derived from the old 888 World Superbike racer. Up front, you can see from the fork tops here, forks are fully adjustable. You've got your preload, your rebound, and your compression damping down below. Also down there, you can see we've got Brembo calipers and 320mm discs, so you've got all the sort of trick bits there. Up here, very neat little cockpit here got a digital display bringing it bang up to date and then you've got your speedo your rev counter and the old idiot lights looking at the bars there nothing really special you'll recognize the ducati switch gear as normal there is a little choke lever on this side looking at the screen blade here me being taller, I could do with a slightly taller one, and luckily Ducati actually make one. £55 it'll cost you, just screws in there, replaces that one. The mirrors as well, they're pretty good on this one, at least you can actually see what's behind you. They vibrate a little bit, but the view's clear enough. And with a clear view ahead and that big comfy seat, it all makes for a really comfortable ride. Slightly pitched forward, the riding position is all the better for nudging 150 on your leisurely tour. In the twisty bits, the six-speed gearbox is a perler. Crisp and light, it makes playing a pleasure. So what else has it got to make it a practical tourer? Well, if I just lift the seat a minute, one good thing that it's got in there, if you can see it, see that shape there? That's for a U-lock. U-lock goes in there, and I mean, you need that these days with bike theft being as it is. Pretty someone's pinched the one out of here, isn't it? 
Under there goes a little tool roll, so that's all pretty neat in there. But something else it's got, and you've seen the bike standing on its stand, is a centre stand. And over this side, just to make it easier to lift it up on the stand, you've got a neat little fold-out lever to save you grabbing hold of that pillion rest. So how much for Ducati's Classy Tourer? It's going to cost you $8,250 on the road, complete with a two-year unlimited mileage guarantee. As far as the panniers go, or the side cases, if you want to call them that, they're going to cost you £415 for the pair, and the top box will cost you £235. Wouldn't it be good if we all had somewhere that we could write to to voice our opinions, to tell the world what we thought about things in the world of biking? It could be things like this. Parking problems. Lack of parking spaces, in fact, in a city centre. And don't think we're only interested in people who ride big, fancy superbikes. If you ride a little scooter like this, then your opinion is just as important. So if you ride a two-wheeler, we want to hear from you. One, two, three, four. Who's directing this? Can he count? Is he stupid or what? It might be about the state of a particular road in your area. But it doesn't have to be something bad. You might want to air your views about something good. You might think somebody deserves a pat on the back. So if you have got a view on anything bikey at all, then tell us and we'll tell the rest of the world. Here's the address you can write to. Two Wheels, Men and Motors, Granada TV, Key Street, Manchester M69EA. Or alternatively, you can email us at this address. There it is, twowheels at granadamedia.com. Write to us. It would be rude not to. This is a Kawasaki ZX9. It's a high-performance sports motorcycle. What do you suppose would happen then if we strapped two of these together? We'd have twice the power, but we'd need twice the wheels. Now this man drives a Tiger car and it's powered by, yes you've guessed it, two ZX9 Kawasaki bike engines. My name's Chris Allenson and I'm from Oldbury in East Yorkshire. Uh, we're here today with Sports Car Magazine trying to set a, a British record for 0 to 60 with our car. Basically, the car is a, a standard Tiger B6 kit car, which we've modified the chassis to accept two motorcycle engines. The engines we've chosen are Kawasaki ZX9Rs, each producing 150 horsepower. So the combined total at the back wheels is 300 horsepower. The curb weight of the car is 583 kilos, and so it's got a phenomenal power to weight ratio of somewhere near 600 horsepower per tonne. We've, in practice before, on, in ideal conditions, we've done 2.7s, 7.4s, somewhere around there, so it's fast time. Today's a little bit restrictive because we're doing it in a car park, so they've got spectators and safety is an issue, but we should get somewhere around the three second mark, I would have thought. This car's been so successful and people are so interested in it that we're building another one based on the same chassis again, but this time using two ZX12R Kawasaki engines, which means an increase of 600cc, another 100 horsepower, but this one's going to be four wheel drive. So the advantage there is that instead of having wheel spin on the start, we can use more power and we should hit 60 in two and a half seconds somewhere around there, probably two twos. These cars are a turnkey car is available at 29,950. Um, you can build one yourself for like 22 grand. Yeah, we've got a little company called Z Cars doing modifications and building, actually building this car. It's gone very well, the weather's been kind, there's lots of crowds here and uh, we've had a good day. 
a bit difficult in a car park, but we've managed a 3-1, so that's good enough, really. And uh, when we get to the proper day, I think we'll crack the record. Well, I'm sure you'll agree, it seems an awful lot of fun. It's very, very fast, it's extremely noisy, and it seems to be just as much fun as a bike. Well, almost. Well, that's all for part one, but be sure to join us after the break when we'll be looking back at some of our favourite bits of the last 12 months. Welcome back to Two Wheels now. As promised, a little look back now over the last 12 months at some of our favourite bits. So let's start with the bikes themselves. It's not all show and no go. That torquey motor means that 90% of the torque is available from a lowly 2750 revs. In fact, you can pull away in third if you really wanted to. And interestingly, you can still feel a tiny bit of vibration, but it really is tiny, and it's actually been designed in to give it some real character. Now, talking of the engine, because that's what the Bonneville is all about, this is their air-cooled lump. Light, but not flighty, quick to change direction, but predictable and stable. When it comes to stopping, it's hero to zero in no time at all. That front brake could have you on your nose in a second. Those dinner plate sized discs living up to their impressive looks. Massively powerful, but with plenty of feel. Never mind all that, you might say, is it better than an R1? What's better in this world of hyper performance? It does everything it was designed to do. Both bikes are virtual perfection. In pure ultimate performance terms, the R1 might just have the edge, but in the real world we ride in, there really is nothing in it. The R1 is sold in huge numbers, and today it just gets better and better. The latest 2001 model has had more than 150 changes made to it. Many of these are minor ones, perhaps a few nuts, bolts and washers here and there, but some have been quite significant. Big changes have taken place in the gearbox. The early models, although great fun, did have a tendency to send the front wheel skywards in first and second gear. The gearing now has been changed. First and second gears are now longer in the attempt to keep the front end down and to make the bike more rideable. Thankfully though, it hasn't taken away any of the fun and thrashing an R1 still produces a huge grin factor. Perhaps I was judging things a little bit too quickly. Yes, I did hate it at first, but after what, three or four hundred miles or so, I started to slip into the groove, as they say. I really think it's a case of what you've been used to. If you've served your time on four-cylinder machines, then you'll probably hate the twins. There again, if you've been brought up with twins, you'll probably love the new Firestorm. It is slightly lumpy at low revs, and it likes to be spinned at somewhere around three and a half thousand revs before things start to smooth out. And it doesn't go completely smooth until you hit 4,000 revs, by which time in top gear you're doing 75 miles an hour. And although it might be great fun, you can't travel everywhere at that kind of speed. This is a serious performance motorcycle. The technology certainly works. The bike feels much lighter than it is, more like a 600 than a 1200, but open that throttle and you know it's a 1200. It's a matter of dialer speed, 90 in first, 120 in second, and so on. But it's not just brute power. The delivery is super smooth and the handling a revelation. Again, this is nothing like the old ZZR 1100, which is like a super tanker in comparison to this. On the ZX12R, you just tip it into the corner and around you go. The suspension is firm, but well controlled and the whole bike really feels nimble. A sort of amazing grace. This is the latest Daytona, the 955i. So what's new? Lots. For a start, it's 10 kilos lighter. It's got a shorter wheelbase and it's got an extra 15 brake horsepower. But what hasn't changed, I'm pleased to say, is that unmistakable Triumph triple howl. It's not an external upset the public exhaust noise. Oh no, this is your private sound system generated by that airbox up under the tank. Wind it up to anywhere between seven and 8,000 revs and here it go. If you're into engines, you'll love this one. It really is addictive. 
the new wing now has an 1800cc fuel injected motor. It's been reshaped and restyled and Honda are daring to use the word sporty in their description of this new bike. I'm not sure it fits my definition of sporty but it does handle superbly and it managed to return an impressive 40 miles to the gallon on our recent round trip to France. And the 650cc in this machine are supplied by Suzuki. In fact, the motor has been lifted straight out of Suzuki's well-respected SV650. The styling is, well, unusual, but if that's not quite wild enough, then there's always the 650 V-Raptor, which for an extra £400 or so, has even more odd-shaped bodywork. Aggressive looks combined with a motor with plenty of poke, but not quite so much that it scares you to death. We don't spend all of our time, you know, just riding around and talking about fancy bikes. Lots of our time is spent travelling up and down the country, visiting different shows and events, just like these. Volkswagen powered, absolutely enormous thing. And would you believe something like this is actually less than £11,000, yeah, for a production trike like this. The only problem is, I don't think it'll fit in my garage. Well, so much for the production bikes. At this year's show, Wayne and I decided to concentrate on something a little different. We decided to have a look at the specials, the bikes which are better known as the Street Fighters. Now then, why I'm in the water, you might ask. Very, very simple. I want to tell you, that I want to measure the distance from here to here. And these morons here, they won't do the measuring, so I've had to take my shoes off, and it is cold because the riders have got to go from here right the way across here. No big deal. Apart from you've got to remember that these rocks are very likely to be wet. And this is in fact 11 foot. So will they jump it? Maybe not, because they might not want to go in the water or they might go in the water and bring some water up onto the tires and onto the rock. But when they've done this, they're going to mess around on these other rocks and then up the waterfall. And when the waterfall and the water is running, that is one of the hardest obstacles in the trial. It may not look particularly difficult, but rest assured that will definitely, that will show the men off from the boys. seem like 12 months does it but it is believe me since I was stood here on this roof talking to me old mate and your mate Jeff. Now Jeff you know more about this show than, than anybody I think don't you? You want to have a play don't you? Well if you're 16 and under you can do so you pay £10 and you get tuition to have a go on a little bike like this or a bit bigger if you're a bigger fella and you are 16 most 16 year olds are bigger than me and you go and get tuition from the boys over here teach you how to ride have an hour's lesson and have some fun on it and play and then at the end of it all you get a certificate a rider competence certificate you will notice it's not been filled in because I haven't yet passed my test but nonetheless I think it's a great idea encouraging young lads or ladies of course to have a go on an off-road bike with a bit of a, um, skilled tuition and end up being a competent bike rider all within an hour. Ying, 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 ying. <laughs> As you know, this show is called Two Wheels, which means anything with two wheels. It doesn't just mean big, fancy, powerful superbikes. Scooters have their very own place on this show as well. So if you've got yourself a trendy scooter like this in this beautiful blue to match my apparel and look stylish, young, eh, like myself, then you could always pull the birds. Now, have I got any bread with me? Let's see. 
All right then, Twinkle. All right, darling. You know what I have worked out all by myself? The reason why they give me these scooters to road test is because they are aimed at a stylish and trendy young person. So obviously, they're gonna pick me. Have you ever seen anything like that before? Because this is BMW's C1. Now I've got to say that this is really no different than any other scoot. The method of riding it is exactly the same and the overall appearance is just like most modern scoots. Very Italian really in its style. Now a feet forward style takes some getting used to but it's certainly comfortable and the weather protection is really effective. Weight wise it's certainly in the bike class at 197 kilos, well over any 600cc sports bike for instance but it's got the power to cope and overtaking at 70 plus is an everyday experience. Well, that's all from Two Wheels for this week and indeed for 2001, but we'll be back next week in 2002 with lots, lots more for you. So all that remains for me to say is a very happy new year and we'll see you next week. Mm.